The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, what I have on the board here is what we are going to cover today and what we had covered the last time. Uh, those in blue here are the ones we had covered the last time, and the rest of them, five through nine, are the ones we are going to cover today. Actually, uh, the last time I didn't have this last step here, dreaming and rapid eye movement sleep. If there is time, I want to say a few words about that because that's a very interesting topic and brings us uh, to make a few comments about Freudian theory. All right then, so we are going to then start with a description of the cortical structures that are involved in eye movement control. Now the first thing I want to do is to show you once again the monkey brain. You're already familiar with those items which are on here. Here's V1, here's V4, here's a superior temporal sulcus that contains areas MT and MST, and of course here's the central sulcus, principalis, and the arcuate. Another structure involved in eye movement control is the lateral intraparietal sulcus, which is in here. And then another one is the medial intraparietal sulcus, but those two perform similar tasks, and so I'm not going to talk about the uh, MIP separately from LIP. And then here in the frontal lobe, we have the frontal eye fields. As the name implies, of course, it has a lot to do with eye movement control. And then here, very close to the midline, we have the medial eye fields, which also play a role in eye movement control. So now we have all these structures, and this is not, not by any means totally complete, because these deal mostly with uh, saccadic eye movements and to a lesser degree with pursuit eye movements. But uh, the fact is that there are all these areas that play a significant role in eye movement control. And of course, those people who want to understand eye movement control need to figure out what these various structures do for you to enable you to look around with the great ease that you can look around with, actually. So anyway, let's try a number of uh, views of how to go about finding out the operational characteristics of these areas, and furthermore, also to find out how they interconnect. Now, one approach that has been very useful in delineating the areas in the visual cortex and even in subcortical areas uh, is to use electrical stimulation because it has been found, as, as we had discussed la the last time, that when you electrically stimulate some structures heavily involved in eye movement control, like the colliculus, at low current levels, uh, electrical stimulation can elicit a saccade. And by looking at the characteristics of that, as we had in the colliculus, you can gain further insights about what the roles are of these various areas. And of course, people have done electrical stimulation all over creation in the visual cortex as well as in other cortical areas, uh, thereby trying to determine whether or not the electrical stimulation elicits a motor response. And of course, if you do this in motor cortex, then you get a motor response. And if you do, do it in areas which are specifically connected with eye movement control, you get eye movements. So, here is an example of the kinds of things we can do. Here is a monkey brain, and of course, as we had discussed already, from the brain stem are the signals sent to the eye muscles, which provides the so-called rate code. And then above that, we have the superior colliculus. Uh, and then in the back, we have V1 that you're already familiar with, V2, LIP, frontal eye fields, and the medial eye fields. So now let's ask the question, what happens when we electrically stimulate these cortical areas? And also to compare that with what happens when you stimulate in the superior colliculus. So we already know that when you stimulate the colliculus, what you get 
is wherever you put the electrode in the colliculus and you find out where the receptive field is of the cells that you will be stimulating, that when you then convert and stimulate, you get a saccade that brings the fovea into the center of the receptive fields of the neurons uh, that you are stimulating. And that is laid out in a nice topographic fashion. And that is shown here uh, in a schematic fashion. So that no matter where the eye starts at any given point, if you electrically stimulate, you get the same vector saccade in the superior colliculus. So you have what is called a vector code, which if you remember is quite different from the code that you have in the brain stem, where you have a rate code. So now, the question is, suppose we now start stimulating these other cortical areas that I had designated in the previous slide, and ask the question, what happens in those places? All right, so if you stimulate the visual cortex, in this case V1, for example, you get the same kind of coding operation. You get vector saccades, okay, constant vector saccades. Then if you do the same thing in LIP, you also get a constant vector saccade. And if you do that in the frontal eye fields, you still get the same thing. So all of these areas seem to be coding saccadic vectors. But now, when you stimulate in the medial eye fields, you get a very different kind of effect. Very interesting. What you get here is what is called a uh, place code, meaning that when you stimulate in various regions of the medial eye fields, the eye, wherever it starts, converges on a particular point, which we will call the motor field. Okay? And di different regions in the medial, medial eye fields have motor fields that generate uh, different locations to which the eye will saccade when you stimulate there. So that's a very different kind of code from all the others. So now the next question is, that we want to pose is how do the signals from all these cortical areas get down to the brain stem? So what kind of experiment do you think you would want to do to get some easy answers to that? So to, to perhaps highlight that, some people thought that the signals from all of these areas go down to the colliculus and then the colliculus sends its signals down to the brainstem. So if that's the case, what, would you, what experiment would you do? Well, the experiment you would do is you would remove the superior colliculus, OK? And then again, stimulate all of these areas. If the hypothesis that all these areas send their signals through the superior colliculus to the brainstem is correct, then you would no longer get any saccades when you electrically stimulate in the cortex at any of these sites. Got it? All right, now let's see if an experiment like that had been done. And yes, it, yes, it has been. So here it, it is. Here we're going to remove the superior colliculus. All right, now think about it for a minute. Think what you would hypothesize will happen. Well, what happens is quite dramatic. When you stimulate, uh, in V1, V2, and LIP, you no longer get a saccade. Somehow the signals to generate a saccade from these areas seem to be going through the colliculus, because once the colliculus is not there, those signals are ineffective. Now what happens in the frontal lobe? All right, what happens there is quite interesting. You still get saccades, and you still get the same coding operation. You get a constant vector code when you stimulate the frontal eye fields. And you get your place code in the medial eye fields. And you get that at the same old thresholds. So that discovery then resulted in the hypothesis, first of all, that these posterior areas send their signals to the brain stem through the colliculus, which we'll call then the posterior system. And the ones in the anterior portions of the brain from medial and frontal eye fields seem to be able to uh, gain direct access, bypassing the colliculus, uh, to the brain stem, is it because they're still effective when you stimulate there. And so we can call that the anterior system. 
All right? Now, of course, these two systems uh, need to talk to each other, which, which they do. There are plenty of connections there. Because, of course, if you will, the left hand has got to know what the right hand is doing. So anyway, this is then a very summary arrangement. And now we can proceed to ask some questions about just what do these various areas do? And to understand that better, we need to look into more detail about the nature of electrical stimulation and compare that with the nature of uh, eye movements made to visual targets. So let's look at that next time. So we're going to look at the effects of paired electrical and visual stimulation. All right, so uh, the uh, first thing we're going to look at is what happens when you stimulate two sites, say, in the colliculus at the same time. And if you remember, medial is up and lateral is down. So if you stimulate each of those alone, you get here, in number one, you get an upward saccade. You stimulate number two, you get a downward saccade. Now the question comes up, what happens when you stimulate both at the same time? Well, there are a number of hypotheses that have been proposed. And by now, it's been well established that what happened is that you get a vector average saccade. Not vector summation, but vector averaging. Okay. Now to prove that that is indeed vector averaging, if you take the same experiment, but you put one electrode in the anterior portion and the other electrode in the posterior one of the colliculus, this one, of course, generates a small saccade, and this one a large saccade. So if it vector averages, you should get an in-between saccade. If it vector sums, then it should get a bigger saccade than either of those. And you indeed get a vector average saccade. So depending on this arrangement or this arrangement, you get the same vector average saccade because the only thing that's happening here is you excite the neurons in the colliculus by virtue of this electrical stimulation. Now think about that for a minute. If this were the case uh, with visual stimuli, suppose two visual stimuli come up, it would be a total disaster if you made an eye movement in between the two of them, wouldn't it? So somehow there's some mechanisms in the brain that force you, force you, I guess <laughs> that may not be the right word, uh, uh, achieve the ability to select one or the other of the visual targets accurately and not be vector averaging it. Now, to accomplish that, logically speaking, what you need is some inhibitory circuits and a mechanism for selection and then a decision as to where to look. All right, so to highlight that, uh, let me just say one more thing about electrical stimulation. This is true what I told you about vector averaging with electrical stimulation, even when you stimulate the two, uh, the two uh, superior colliculi or two different locations in the brain. Each of those gives you an eye, an eye movement into the left or right hemisphere, and yet they also vector average. So now let's look at what happens when a similar situation is used in a real experiment where the monkey looks at visual targets. And so what you do here is you present these two targets at the same time. And so the monkey, in a sense, has to make a decision, or you have to make a decision as to where to look. And as long as there's a nice big separation here, which is 90 degrees in this case, what you can see here, here are the real eye movements, that half the time the monkey looks to the left, half the time to the right, and he makes very, very few in-between saccades. Whereas if you're electrically stimulated at, the, at these sites in the colliculus, you'd get a vector average saccade, just like what I had shown you uh, here. OK? All right, so now, that being the case, uh, we can move on and ask some additional questions about what happens when you bring the two uh, stimuli closer together. All right? The closer together they get, the more difficult is to make an independent decision as to whether to look to the left or the right target that comes up above the fixation spot. So here's an example of that. Actually, what I'm going to do is this. Let, let me delay for a little bit what happens with that. And first, I want to tell you about what happens with various kinds of lesions that you make on eye movements. And then we'll talk about this question of 
the angular separation between the two visual targets. OK, so therefore, let's um, do the reason I want to do this first is to give you a sort of a, a real sense when you do very informal kind of testing. And by informal testing, what I mean is that you're going to see a monkey actually perform eye movements. OK? Uh, so here we are. Here's a monkey. Uh, here's his brain, so to speak. And this is what we call, of course, an intact animal. And now what I'm going to do, I'm going to start a movie for you to see what kinds of eye movements he makes when we present some apple pieces for the monkey to eat. OK, are you ready? Here it is. Can everybody see this OK? So you can see that when a, an apple piece appears, the monkey makes a saccade to it and grabs it and stuffs it in his mouth and eats it. OK, so that's what a normal monkey does uh, with his fully <coughs> intact functional brain. So now we're going to ask the question, what happens if you take out the colliculus on one side, in meaning a unilateral lesion, what happens to the eye movements the monkey makes uh, subsequent to such a lesion? Are you ready for that? Here we are. It's the same monkey. You can see that his eye movements may be a little bit smaller, slower perhaps, but he still looks to the left and to the right quite well. He, he tends to sort of look towards the side of the lesion when there's no stimulus. Okay? But other than that, he seems to make really rather, rather good eye movements in spite of the fact that he has a colliculus missing on one side. So what that means is that uh, just looking at what the monkey does in this qualitative manner is not going to um, <coughs> tell you too much about what these various structures do. And so consequently, you have to carry out some more refined experiments to determine what kinds of deficits do arise when you take out the colliculus, you take out other uh, cortical structures uh, for the generation of eye movements. So let me first of all tell you about a really interesting finding that was made uh, that had nothing to do with the colliculus at the time it was made. It was a strictly a behavioral study, much of it done on humans. What was done is, first of all, a fixation spot came on, and then a single target appeared. And often what was done is that the fixation spot was turned off just a few milliseconds uh, before the target came on. And on each trial, it appeared someplace else. Okay? So then you collected a lot of data to, to see what is the nature of the monkey's eye movements. And in particular, that initial study um, examined uh, by Fisher and Boch, examined what the latency distribution was of the eye movements made. And they made an incredible discovery that they subsequently generated hundreds of studies published in numerous journals. And this is the discovery. Here we have the latency of saccades made. And here's a number of saccades. And what you get is a bimodal distribution of saccadic latencies. Amazing. They call the first mode, which takes place with a latency of average latency for bright stimulus of about 100 milliseconds are called express saccades. The second mode they called regular saccades, and that took about, I don't know, 135, 140 milliseconds uh, 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 on the average. So they got this bimodal distribution. And so people said, my goodness, what could this be due to? How do we explain this effect? What are the cortical or subcortical mechanisms that give rise to a bimodal distribution of saccadic latencies? As I've said, a huge number of experiments had been carried out to find this out. So when one group of investigators saw this phenomenon, and they did experiments with monkeys, and they found this was a real effect everywhere. These findings were initially made in Germany. And even, even in the United States, you get a bimodal distribution of saccades in both humans and in monkeys. 
So uh, once that was established as a really solid effect, people began to speculate as to what are the neural un underlying neural mechanisms. And as I've told you earlier, it was noted that uh, <coughs> based on those lesion studies of the colliculus, which eliminated saccades from the posterior uh, portion of the cortex, but not from the interior, that uh, there is a reasonable hypothesis involved in proposing that you have a posterior system and an anterior system. And so when people saw this, they said, aha, now we know why we have these two systems. One is for making rapid saccades, and the other one is to making regular saccades. And so they proposed that the posterior system does one of these, and the anterior system does the other. Well, that was a nice hypothesis. But so often, when it comes to hypotheses as to how the brain works, uh, often, most of the time, uh, the hypotheses end up being wrong. And so what you need to do, rather than to just hypothesize, is to actually carry out experiments to test the hypothesis. So what is the test of this hypothesis? What would you do as an experimentalist? Well, yes. Very good. You could ablate. All right. So one thing you can do, first of all, you can ablate the superior colliculus. Even though when you saw that, just with a uh, regular uh, easy test, just filming it, uh, you didn't see much of a deficit. It, you had sort of a sense that maybe the mark is a bit slower. But other than that, it wasn't that clear. But if you take out the colliculus, then you eliminate the posterior system, in essence. All right? And so the question is, what happens when you do that? And then you can ask the question, what happens when you take out some other cortical areas? So let's look at this. Here we have a monkey. Uh, 10 weeks after the colliculus had been ablated, we're talking about a major effect here that doesn't recover. And you took out the colliculus on one side, to, on the left, OK? So that controls rightward saccades. And therefore, when you look at the leftward saccades, that's to the intact side of the brain, you get your usual bimodal distribution of saccadic latencies. But then, when you look at rightward saccades, lo and behold, you don't see a single expressed saccade. And even the regular saccades have a longer latency uh, than the ones to the intact side. And these are collected at the same time. The monkey is sitting there with his head fixed. And sometimes the target appears on the left, sometimes on the right. And you collect hundreds and thousands of trials that way. And you test this over various time periods. And this is, I say, it's 10 weeks, two and a half months uh, after the lesion. And even if you test the monkey a year later, you still get the same effect. So this clearly points out the fact the ability to make these rapid reflex-like saccades is something that's got to go through the superior colliculus. Okay? So now we can ask the question, well, what about if one makes lesions in the frontal and medial eye fields? All right? So think about that for a minute. What would you predict? All right, so here we go. We take out the frontal eye fields in this case. Ready? Oops, let me go back. We take out the frontal eye fields, but to give you a sense of this overall effect, first of all, let's just do the same informal testing that I had shown you before with the colliculus and see what the movie looks like. Okay? Here's a monkey, not as handsome as the other one, but uh, what you do here is the person behind there sometimes just presents a target and sometimes just moves it around so the monkey tracks it. Can you see that? And what I, should, I shouldn't have told you which frontal eye field had been ablated. Uh, look at how nicely he tracks on both sides. Grabs it, puts it, stuffs it in his mouth. And so the monkey seems to be perfectly fine with making saccades to either side and perfectly fine making uh, pursued eye movements either direction, indicating that this informal testing doesn't reveal anything truly obvious 
about the deficit that you have in eye movement control when you take out the frontal eye fields. So therefore, you again need to go on to carry out some more careful experiments uh, to obtain some detailed quantitative data. So let's look at that. Uh, first of all, let's go back and look at express saccades. You take out the frontal eye fields, and lo and behold, you still get the express saccades, indicating that that is definitely specific for the uh, posterior system. Even further, if you do this experiment, what you find, if you take out both the medial and frontal eye fields, you still get it. You still get your express saccades. So clearly, these two areas are not directly involved in generating quick, rapid saccadic eye movements. And it's still bimodal. So that initial hypothesis that the first mode is the colliculus and the second posterior system in the colliculus, and the second mode is uh, the anterior system is clearly totally wrong. All right, so that's what then happens. And once this has been done, I say, well, uh, you've got to find something that the frontal eye and the median eye fields are doing. So let's come up with some other experiments to see whether the monkey is selective for anything else when it comes to lesions of the frontal and the medial eye fields. All right, so one thing that had been proposed is that maybe the important factor is some higher level eye movement activity, such as making saccades in quick succession to successive targets that are out there. Okay. So the way that can be done quantitatively is you have the monkey first fixate, OK? And after you fixate, you present the target, and then you present the second target. So the monkey has to make two successive saccades. And what you can do is you can vary the uh, temporal delay between their succession. So the monkey then has to make a plan to, to make two saccades because these two stimuli appear before the monkey starts his initial saccade when the temporal interval is short. So then the monkey somehow knows as he, says to do, he has to do this, uh, even though he starts the saccade only after the two targets had come on when they are presented indeed in a short, with a short latency. So that's what happens. And of course, on different trials, you have different kinds of pairings like that. And if you do that, what you find is very interesting here, the four conditions. This shows the monkey's performance 18 weeks post left frontal eye field lesion. And this shows it 60 weeks after. And it shows this to the intact side and the side where the frontal eye fields are missing. And what you can see very dramatically is that the monkey really has difficulties in making a plan to execute two saccades in a row. Quite dramatic effect, uh, significant between the 0.01 level, of course, uh, indicating that the frontal eye fields play a role in planning sequences of eye movements. Now then, another, well, this I want to show you uh, uh, what happens with the, uh, when you compare the effects of the frontal eye field lesion and the medial eye field lesion, and this is done over uh, various sequence durations and for several weeks. And what you find is that in both cases there is a recovery, but the effect is much, much more dramatic with the front frontal eye field lesion than a medial eye field lesion. So indeed, uh, there's, for the frontal eye fields, we can say that frontal eye fields play an important role in planning sequences of eye movements, which is sort of a higher level activity in uh, executing saccadic eye movements. Now then, what we can do is to examine what about making a decision of where to look when, when more than one target comes up. And the simplest form of that is that you present two targets like that. Okay? And so the monkey has to make a decision, am I going to look to the left or to the right? And then what you do is you can vary the temporal delay between the two like that, or like that. Okay, And then you can do that again, either to intact parts of the visual field or those where uh, either frontal eye fields or some other structure is missing. All right, so let's look at what happens. Here is what we have is, is the intact monkey. 
This part I've shown you before, all right? Th this is when the two targets come on simultaneously. And in this case, the left target comes on 34 milliseconds before the right, and here's the reverse. And what you can see that even a 34 millisecond delay causes the monkey to very much prefer to go to the, to the target, make a saccade to the target that had appeared first. So that's what happens in a normal intact monkey. Now, we can ask the next related question still in a normal intact monkey. What happens when you put the two stimuli closer together? OK, so here's an example. They, now they're separated only by 40 degrees. And here are the data. Again, it shows that when it's, uh, in this case, 67 milliseconds apart, the monkey chooses almost exclusively the target that comes on first. When they are simultaneous, what happens is interesting. You get some so-called vector every saccades, which you always get with electrical stimulation. So those you get is still a minority of the saccades. And if the closer you bring the two together, the more frequent will be the vector every saccades. When they're only separated by 10 degrees, uh, they will be all vector every saccades. So this is what happens in a normal monkey. Um, you get this nice bimodal distribution and vector every saccades when the two are simultaneous. Now let's ask the question, what happens when you take out uh, a cortical structure, in this case the frontal eye fields, and here we are, we take out the left frontal eye fields. These above are the same data I had just shown you, adding uh, a bigger delay here, just to make it even clearer that by that time, the monkey never chooses the target that comes on second. And here we have a mon the monkey uh, after left frontal eye field lesion. And look at what, what happens. What happens is that the monkey at, at zero chooses 100% of the time the saccade to the intact side. Okay? There seems to be a little bit of a shift here. Uh, and then when they're 100 milliseconds, then you have an equal distribution. So to equalize the choice that the brain makes, you have to now, because of the missing frontal eye fields, present one of the targets 100 milliseconds earlier on the affected side to get the same kind of distribution that you get in the intact monkey. So this further highlights the fact that the frontal eye fields play a significant role in making decisions about uh, the selection of visual targets. All right, now we can look at this more quantitatively. This shows the distribution of choices okay, to the left target. This is the intact monkey, preoperative. And then when you take out the left frontal eye fields, it's a huge movement over. Uh, the equal choices has to be about 130 milliseconds uh, separated, with the affected side getting the target 130 milliseconds earlier. Then if you keep doing this, there's some recovery. But even four years later, you still have a huge effect. Now you can ask the question, what, what if you do the same experiment in the medial eye fields? And so if you do that, you first of all get a small effect to begin with. And after just 16 weeks, there's full recovery. So obviously, the medial eye fields don't, do not seem to play a central role in making decisions as to which target to look at when more than one target appears in the visual field. All right. So now, having done that quantitative work indicating that the frontal eye fields play an important role in target selection and the sequencing of eye movement, we can move on and ask the question, well, we talked about the uh, posterior system and the anterior system. Uh, is it true uh, that there are, there are these two systems? Or uh, are there many more systems that we're not aware of? This should remind you of the fact that it had been proposed when we talked about extrastriate cortex, that area of V4 is central for, uh, for uh, processing higher level activity, including color, whereas the uh, area MT and MST play an important role in motion. 
Uh, and so it was proposed that these two major systems in the posterior cortex, the medial and the lateral, if you will. And uh, so the question was raised, if you remove both of these areas, meaning the gateway to these areas, V4 and, the, uh, 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 and MT, what happens? And when you do that, they still, the monkey is able to do a lot of things, indicating that we have more pathways from V1 than the, just these two, the, anterior, uh, the uh, medial and the lateral. So now the question is, what about when it comes to this eye movement control? Uh, we should do the same kind of experiment. Uh, we should remove the colliculus that supposedly eliminates the posterior system, and then we should remove the frontal eye fields bilaterally uh, that eliminates the anterior system. So now the question is, what happens when you do that? And again, we're going to turn to the informal test, meaning we're going to, we're going to take a movie of the monkey who has these uh, areas removed. Think about it for a minute. What do you think is going to happen? OK, so here's the monkey. Ready? The monkey sees well. He makes uh, his movements with his hands uh, quite accurately. But what, what happens to the eyes? You're watching the eyes, right? No eye movement. Everybody see this? Should I show it again? <coughs> the monkey makes no eye movements. He cannot make eye movements. Because his natural tendency would be just like I had seen in the previous movies, that he makes eye movements to the uh, apple pieces so he can grab them. He still pays attention to them. Everything is fine, except he doesn't move his eyes. Because he can't move his eyes as a result of having eliminated these two systems. And because of that, we can say with confidence that it's, as far as the visual, uh, as, as far as the ocular motor system is concerned, uh, we indeed have these two major pathways, which when they're eliminated, eliminates your ability to move, make saccadic eye movements. OK. Now, let's go back to uh, the effect of electrical stimulation uh, to gain further insights about what these various areas do. And what you can do in these experiments is not only to stimulate at a high level to elicit a saccade, but you can stimulate at a lower level uh, and then pair that with the appearance of a visual target. This then enables you to see whether the, the, there's summation here or if there's interference. So let's look at that. All right, here is again a monkey brain. And what I'm going to tell you is what happens when you do this experiment in V1, in LIP, and in the frontal eye fields. Even maybe, I think I may have something also in the medial eye fields. All right, so let me describe the experimental procedure for you so that you understand how these kinds of experiments are conducted. You put an electrode in to any of these structures, and you find the receptive field first, all right? Once you found the receptive field, you electrically stimulate, and you confirm the fact that the electrical stimulation brings the fovea into the receptive field of the simulated neurons uh, when you do this in all the areas except in the medial eye fields. Then uh, what you do is you actually present a visual target there. okay? And lastly, uh, you present two visual targets, and you electrically stimulate to see how it biases your choice as a result of this in most cases, subthreshold electrical stimulation. So if you do that, what you find is, first of all, if you do this experiment with a, an intact monkey without stimulation, uh, you find, say, a receptive field here. And then um, you simply see what the monkey's choices are left to the right. And what we plot here is the Saccades made to the target in the receptive field. And what you can see is what I've shown you before. Namely, when the two targets are simultaneous, then the monkey chooses left or right with equal probability. Now we're going to add the electrical stimulation uh, and ask the question, 
is the, can we shift the curve to the left? If you shift it to the left, that means that the electrical stimulation facilitated the choice. And if you shift to the right, it means that it uh, caused interference. It lessened the ch chances of the monkey making a saccade into that area, meaning the stimulation created inhibition. Got it? All right, so here's an example in the lower layers of V1. In the, remember, in layer 6 of area V1 is where you have your complex cells that project down to the superior colliculus. So here, if you stimulate at subthreshold levels, and some of these are very low levels, only 7.5 and, and 10 microamps, OK, really very, very fine currents, which in themselves don't elicit an eye movement. So if you do that, uh, the stimulation created a significant, highly significant facilitatory effect. This is in the lower layers. Now, if you do the same experiment in the upper layers, you get the opposite effect. You get a gigantic, even at, look at this, 5 and 10 microamps. Uh, even at that low, incredibly low level, you get a gigantic interference effect. So that says that there's a complex interplay in V1 uh, in the decision process that arises as to whether you're going to look at a target or whether you're not going to look at a target. Now we can do the same experiment in LIP. And in some regions, you get this huge facilitatory effect. And in other regions, you get an inhibitory effect. So that's LIP. So therefore, this structure also plays a significant role in deciding whether to look at or not to look at a visual stimulus. And here it shows that in LIP, as you increase the current, you get a gigantic increase in the latency uh, in these inhibitory areas uh, with which a saccade can be generated, indicating that LIP plays an important role in whether uh, you're going to look at a target or whether you're not going to look at a target. OK, and then if you do the frontal eye fields, everywhere in the frontal eye fields, you get a huge facilitatory effect. And in the medial eye fields, uh, you also get a facilitatory effect as long as the uh, motor field is where the visual target appears. But now you can remember what I told you about the medial eye fields. The fact is that they there have a place code. So one can do a different experiment in which instead of presenting the uh, target in the motor field, you can present the, the, uh, the uh, fixation spot there. So here again, to remind you, we have this place code. So now we do this experiment, just like what I'd shown you before, just to repeat it. In this case, the, the, the target appears, and that causes a facilitation. In this case, you put the fixation spot in there, and the location of the targets just displaced. And when you do that, you get a huge inhibitory effect, because somehow the electrical stimulation forces the animal keep the eye at the location where the motor field is in the medial eye field. And this, this is a very important point, and it means that the medial eye fields plays a significant role in deciding how to long to look at a target before making the left next saccade. OK, so now we're going to, it's a lot of facts, so, and we're going to get some more a lot of facts. So now I'm going to summarize what I told you about with the effects of subthreshold electrical stimulation. OK, if you stimulate in the upper layers of V1 and V2, V2 I should add to this, you get interference. In the uh, lower layers, you get facilitation. In V4, there was no effect. I didn't talk about that before. In LIP, you can get both facilitation interference and also fixation increase. In the frontal eye fields, you get facilitation. and the medial eye fields, Depending on how you set it up, you can get facilitation if the target appears in the uh, motor field, and you get inhibition when it um, appears when, when the fixation spot appears in it. So that's the basic summary of these effects. Now, what these findings indicate that somehow inhibitory circuits are essential in our ability to make saccades to selected visual targets. And therefore, 
what we want to do is to examine what happens when you, you use various kinds of pharmacological agents that uh, either facilitate or uh, increase inhibition. So to explain that then, uh, let me first of all point out to you that if you take again the whole brain and you look at the colliculus and you look at V1, and you look at LIP, you look at the frontal eye fields, you can study these areas by injecting two kinds of pharmacological agents, by cuculin and muscimol. Some people refer to this as nusimo. I call it muscimo. At any rate, you all know, I'm sure, what this is. Bicuculin is a GAB GABA antagonist, meaning that if you inject it, okay, it uh, stops the effectiveness of inhibition by GABA. Muscimol, on the other hand, is a GABA agonist, meaning that if you inject it, you increase inhibition. All right? Now, I'm, I'm sure that all, all of you must have had enough of a background in biochemistry to know what these two agents are. So now, what we can do is we can inject either one or the other of these agents and assess two things. First of all, we assess eye movements. And secondly, you also have to obviously assess how it affects your visual ability. So let's move on and do this. Uh, the first set of experiments done with this was by Hikusaka and Woods many years ago in the colliculus. So what they did, very clever, beautiful experiment, is that they would put a microelectrode into the colliculus and then initially just stimulate to see what kinds of eye movements you get. And then they would inject either Moschimo or What's the other agent? Very good. And see what happens. Now, which of those is, uh, causes more inhibition? OK. So let's look at that then. If you electrically stimulate, just like I had shown you before, you get a constant vector saccade. No matter where the eye starts, you get the same vector. Now, the question is, what happens to the spontaneous eye movements of the monkey when you first inject Moschimo, okay, which is an agent that mimics, if you will, your GABA, meaning it increases inhibition. And what happens is that the monkey hardly ever makes a saccade with the vectors represented by the area that has been injected. By contrast, if you inject bicuculin, the monkey keeps making saccades with that vector, uh, even when there's nothing out there. Like the release of the area for inhibition, and the signal is sent, sent down to the brainstem, move your eye, move your eye, move your eye, move your eye. That's what happens. So to show this uh, in more detail, then, we can ask wh what happens when you use two behavioral tasks, okay? the so-called pair target task that we already talked about quite a bit. And we talk about a visual discrimination task. And that one is that you're already familiar with, the so-called oddity task. You present several stimuli, one of which is different from the others. All right, so here is an example of the paired target task. What we do here, again, we vary the temporal asynchrony between the two targets, just like what I've shown with electrical stimulation. And this is the monkey's normal behavior. When the two targets are sim simultaneous, the monkey chooses each uh, randomly. Now, let's ask the question. What happens is, uh, again, to remind you, if it goes this way, the curve goes this way, it's facilitation. If the cur curve goes that way, we get interference. So let's ask what happens first of all. Um, no, let, let me also tell you about the audit test just to make sure that you have it. All right? That's the audit test. You know that already. All right, so we can now go on and first examine what happens with Moschimo or Musimo, whatever you prefer to use. OK? Well, again, what's the, what does this agent do? Does it do excitation or inhibition? Inhibition. Very good. Inhibition because it mimics GABA. All right? So let's look at what happens. Here we have a normal monkey, 
Same experiment as before. Here is the, uh, this is V1. Here's a receptive field. You present one visual target there, the other there, and then you vary the temporal asynchrony between them. This is what happens in the normal case, OK? Now we're going to inject uh, the Moschimo and ask yourself the question, the increased inhibition. What do you think is going to happen? Well, it should be pretty obvious. What happens is you get gigantic inhibition. The monkey practically never looks at here because that area is not being activated by the visual stimulus because of the inhibition. And then if you do this over time, uh, even four hours later, there's a huge, huge effect. But by the next day, the monkey recovers, luckily. So one can do this experiment several times because this agent is something that washes out of the brain. All right, so now uh, let's look at what happens in the frontal eye fields. Same experiment, all right? Just a different location with the electrode. And what you get, this is your pre-injection. And once again, after uh, the injection, you get a big interference effect, which recovers by the next day. So that is what you get that, with that. Then uh, let's ag examine what happens in LIP. Curiously, in LIP, there was no effect. All right, so now let's next turn to the so-called oddity task, meaning several stimuli, one of which is different from the others. And what is the monkey's ability to uh, choose the different stimulus? So if you do this with a muscular injection, there's a huge deficit with V1, which you would expect because it destroyed the monkey's ability to analyze the visual stimulus that appeared in the receptive field. Then if you do the same thing with the frontal eye fields, you find uh, a mild deficit. And when you do the same thing in LIP, you get no deficit at all. So this is what then happens with uh, the auditist task. And now what we can do is ask what happens when instead of Moschimo, we are going to inject by cuculin. And we're going to go through the same procedure as what I just shown you. And so we start here in V1. And when you do that, think about it for a minute. Now you're facilitating, supposedly, because you're eliminating inhibition. What do you think you would get? Well, you'll be in for a surprise. What you get is gigantic interference again. Because putting bicuculin in also screwed up your ability in the visual cortex to uh, analyze the visual percept. This, again, recovers over time, but the next day is back to normal. Then if you do the same experiment in the frontal eye fields, what do you think is going to happen? Can you, can you predict what's going to happen just looking at this slide? Why do you think this is such a big empty space here? Huh? OK. Well, look at that. When you put in bicuculin, you get this incredible facilitation. Okay, the monkey, just like in the colliculus, barely can help himself to make a saccade uh, into the field that uh, has been disinhibited. Okay? And that again recovers. Uh, bicuculin is washed out more rapidly than Moschimo, and by the next day, certainly, it's back to normal. Now we can do the same thing, just looking at the uh, eye movements themselves um, to further highlight what I've shown you before. If you put bicuculin in, OK, in the frontal eye fields, the monkey cannot help but make saccades with similar vectors uh, that uh, are represented by the neurons in the injected site. And that's why you have all this. It's a whole staircase of saccades. Bam, 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 bang. The monkey just can't help but make saccades because the signal to make the saccade has been disinhibited. All right, so then uh, we can ask what happens in LIP. And when you do that, you get no effect at all. And if you do uh, now the bicuculin in injection with the auditist task, we can once again ask, well, what happens with that? And then once again, as I've already indicated, both bicuculin and muscimol cause a major interference in your ability to uh, select the odd target, in other words, to visually discriminate. 
But if you do the same thing in the frontal eye fields and in the medial and, and LIP, you get no effect at all. So what this then says, to summarize, all right, is the following. We talk about target selection, which was a two-target task, and the visual discrimination, which was the auditist task. And here we have muscomol, and here we have bicuculin. So if you do that in the frontal eye, in, in V1 first, you get interference. You do it in the frontal eye fields, you get interference with muscomol and great facilitation with bicuculin, and LIP has no effect. And then just to remind you, it has already been shown by Hikosaka and Woods that you get interference and facilitation in the superior colliculus with these two agents. You do the same thing with visual discrimination. You get a major deficit in V1 for both. And you get uh, a mild effect uh, for both, or actually no effect really with bicuculin in the frontal eye fields, and no effect at all in LIP. So these manipulations then give you sort of a sense of what these various areas do in the generation of eye movements that involve not only just to make a saccato target, but to select targets in the visual field, make a decision as to where to look, and also <coughs> to decide when to look. Because every time you make an eye movement, and I should have mentioned that more thoroughly before, you look at something, and how long you can look at it depends on how long it takes you to analyze what you're looking at. Now, in most cases, it takes you uh, maybe, I don't know, 200 milliseconds or less to say, oh, yeah, that's letter A or whatever. Uh, and then you say it's the, the, you, uh, your brain mechanisms tell you, OK, now you know what it is. It's OK for you to move your eye. OK, so that's involved. And then thirdly, you have an important task in making sequences of eye movements so that when you look at a picture like that movie I showed you in the beginning, in the previous lecture, uh, after, when you look at something, then you make a decision as to where to look next, where to look next. And if you keep doing this for, I don't know, 20, 30 saccades, then you get to a stage and you say, oh, now I understand this picture as a whole. All right, so now we're going to summarize of what the tasks are in a very simple situation and what brain structures are involved in it. First of all, let's imagine that you're looking at a fixation spot designated by A. Let's assume that two stimuli come on. And that means that you have to make a decision as to what those two targets are. You have to identify them because you have to select one of those. Okay? And of course, in most cases, we're talking about many targets that are out there. This is a highly sim simplified version. The next step is to decide which of these two targets, now that I know one says A and the other says B, which of those two targets, actually B and C in the picture here, uh, which of these targets should I look at? And so you make a decision, all right, which generates excitation and inhibition, inhibition uh, through excitatory and inhibitory circuits. And then you decide, OK, we're going to look here. And that means that uh, you have to decide which one not to look at in addition to deciding which one to look at because uh, you got to make an accurate saccade. So you don't want a vector average. All right, and then what you need, of course, is a, uh, a map, if you will, of the uh, motor field so that you can generate the appropriate direction of the saccade uh, so that you can decide where you're going to look at. And then lastly, as I've mentioned already before, you also have to make a decision as to when to make that eye movement. So now the, in a very summary fashion, we can talk about the uh, various brain areas involved. Quite a number of different areas are involved in the decision as to what these two stimuli are. They, of course, involve much of the visual system, including also LIP and several other areas. Then, and then you have to make a decision as to which one to look at. Again, several areas involved, notably among them are the frontal eye fields, LIP, and also the medial eye fields. Then uh, you also have to decide which ones not to look at. That involves largely the same areas. And then you need, of course, a topographic arrangement to know where things are. 
And that you can find in many areas, including V1, V2, the frontal eye fields, and the colliculi, which are laid out in a nice topographic fashion. And then lastly, LIP is important for that. And I think to some degree also the medial eye fields, but I'm not sure about that, to decide when you should generate saccadic eye movement. Well, that's very nice and makes you realize that even with the, we never think about making eye movement, uh, all this stuff is going on uh, three times a second. It's amazing. So now you're going to look at what the various visual areas and ocular motor areas are that play a role in this. Okay, and so we're going to create a summary diagram. So here we have, that's the first one I've shown you, which has a rate code that from the brainstem connects with the, with the eye muscles and activates them. Then we have the superior colliculus. Now the superior collic colliculus uh, is under uh, strong inhibitory control, all right? And the several inhibitory circuits that are involved in that and uh, those include um, the substantia nigra that sends inhibitory circuits to the colliculus, okay, that then uh, prevents the colliculus from generating an eye movement because it is under inhibition. Because every time you look around, thousands and thousands of impressions impinge on the colliculus and you only want one of those to actually get down to the deep layers of the colliculus to generate an eye movement. Now, then the substantia nigra is under the, on, under the control of several neural structures, which, many of which go through the so-called basal ganglia. Now we can expand on this and look at the visual input to do this. We already talked about this a lot. It pointed out to you that we have these three major, many, many different uh, types of ganglion cells, the three major ones we talked about with the midget parasol uh, and the so-called W cells uh, that go to, the uh, go to the cortex, and the W cells also project directly to the colliculus. Then from layer five in the visual cortex, you have the cells that project to the superior colliculus, to so the intermediate layers. Uh, uh, and that downflow is controlled predominantly by the parasol system, as we had described. Then we have all these other areas that V1 projects to, V2, MT, V4, and so on. Some of them dominated by input from the parasol system, and others get input from both. And those, in turn, project to the parietal and temporal lobes, and those, in turn, have an important influence on the inhibitory circuits through uh, the basal ganglia and the substantia nigra. Now, then we finally come to the frontal lobe, the frontal eye fields and the medial eye fields, and they in turn have direct access to the brainstem and also connect with the superior colliculus. Now, this is still not the whole story because what you have in addition is a bunch of interconnections among numerous cortical areas. They talk back and forth to each other. Uh, that enables you to make these decisions as to where to look next. Now, if you think this is complete, you're still wrong, because now what we have to realize is that all this circuitry is also uh, one that receives input from several other areas, with the auditory system that you're going to hear a lot about, lot about uh, later on in the course, the somatosensory system, the olfactory system, the smooth pursuit system that we'll mention a little bit next time, the vestibular system, the accessory optic system we'll talk about next time, and the virgin system. So all these feed into, into this incredibly complex circuitry already um, and are essential elements in your ability to move your eyes about. So I think you need to realize, therefore, That something even as simple as just moving your eyes about is an incredibly complicated uh, system involving many structures and involving excitatory inhibitory circuits, interconnections. It's just, it's almost dumbfounding. So that then is the essence of these connections. And 
What I want to turn to next, I think we still have a little time, I want, before I summarize our results for the today, I want to say something about dreaming and rapid eye movements. I think all of you know that every night you sleep, you dream. And what you also know that has been discovered more recently is when you dream, you make rapid eye movements. So it's called REM sleep. And so the question arose, why do we dream? Why do we have REM sleep? <clears throat> now the major um, influence as to why we dream comes from the work of Sigmund Freud, who published a famous book, one of his really great works called The Interpretation of Dreams, <clears throat> which was original version in German, was published in 1900. Okay, so 113 years ago. Now this, this was an incredibly influential book and also central for the emergence of psychoanalysis and has been used extensively to uh, interpret, quotes why we dream. Now the prime, very, in very summary fashion, the prime idea that Freud expressed is that dreaming is equivalent to wishfulling your dreams, your, your wishes, to fulfilling, I should put that, to fulfilling your wishes. Okay? So that's why it's called wish fulfillment dreams. Now that's interesting because <coughs> one of the stories he has in that book of his interpretation of dreams is a woman he was psychoanalyzing <coughs> who one day when she came to be to, to her session said, you know, you told me the other day that dreams are wish fulfillments. He said, I don't believe that. Uh, I had a dream last night and it didn't go along with wish fulfillment. And Freud said, uh, hmm, well, why don't you tell me what the dream was about? Well, my dream was that I went to a store to buy some food because I was going to have a dinner party. And when I got to the store, it was closed. And so I could, as much as I wanted to, I, I couldn't buy the food for the dinner. Freud scratched his eyes, you know, I'm making that up. <laughs> and he said, that's true, he said, uh, you know what? You didn't want to give a dinner party. That's why you dreamt that. So <laughs> that's famous psychoanalytic stuff. Uh, you can always twist the thing, things around so that it fits with your hypotheses. And in this case, Freud felt that indeed, even though she had this, what she thought was a contrary dream, it was a wish fulfillment dream. Well, that's one part of dreaming. But the other part that Freud had emphasized is that when we dream, so many of our wishes are actually unacceptable to ourselves. And therefore, we dream it at night. And so he constructed, uh, in, in many other studies, the idea that in humans, we have three subdivisions of the mind. We have the id, the ego, and the superego. You all know that, right? So what it means that when you dream at night, uh, uh, some of the wishes that you, unacceptable wishes that are in your id, kind of seep through because the superego is not under uh, control since you're asleep. So that was his basic idea. <clears throat> and of course, it was then many years later discovered that uh, whenever you dream, uh, you make all kinds of eye movements. You don't make eye movements when you don't dream, but when you dream, you make eye movements. Now, one of the problems with the Freudian theory is that animals also dream. And in fact, most dramatically, animals that hibernate do a lot of dreaming. And not only dreaming, but those animals also move their eyes about a lot. Okay. So that observation then kind of shifted the notion as to why we have REM sleep. 
And so people thought about that. And one observation that had been made is that when you eliminate a person's ability to move the eyes, such as you lose somehow your ability to uh, activate your eye muscles, and this can be done also in monkeys, uh, what happens in fairly short order is that your eye becomes uh, ill-affected. And what I mean by that is that the eye loses its perfect roundness to some degree. And more notably even, what happens is that your cornea becomes uneven, becomes ridged, because you're not moving your eye. So that discovery then has led to an alternate theory about why we dream, which is not nearly as romantic or, or intriguing as Freudian theory. Namely, that we have REM sleep at night in order, and especially have it in, in animals that hibernate, in order to keep the eyes in healthy condition and to keep the cornea nice and smooth and even. Because if you were not to uh, dream at all and you would sleep eight or 10 hours, then you would have uh, an uneven, would, would result in having an uneven uh, cornea uh, that would make it more difficult for you to see. And the reason for this then is that uh, animals that, which presumably don't have its egos and superegos also dream as do animals that hibernate. And so there's a necessity to move your eyes uh, while you are sleeping or hibernating. So that's an alter alternate theory. And we'll see one of these years uh, whether they're correct. But I can tell you, which may not be very nice, um, that uh, basically Freudian theory has taken quite a nosedive. And in fact, today, psychoanalysis has become largely dead for, for a number of reasons. Uh, and so you don't have too many psychiatrists or psychoanalysts out there uh, performing those psychoanalytic uh, tasks that they had in which a patient lies down on a couch and sort of free associates and uh, uh, sometimes even gets hypnotized to talk about uh, some of his unconscious wishes and so on. So anyway, that's the story for today. And that brings me to an end to eye movement control. I hope you'll appreciate the fact that even a simple system like eye movements uh, is unbelievably complex when it comes to the brain controlling it. Uh, next time, we are going to talk about eye movements. And towards the end of that, I'll come back a little bit and talk more about yet another aspect of eye movement control. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, please. Um, could you just explain again quickly why the vicuculin injection in V1 causes interference? Okay, that's a very good question. Why does vicuculin uh, in in the in V1 cause interference? Because it it screws up the neurons' ability to <coughs> analyze the visual scene. You you mess up the. Uh, uh, center surround antagonism. Uh, you mess up the orientation selectivity of these cells, the direction selectivity of them, so they're no longer able to analyze the visual scene in the normal fashion. I, yeah, it's it, it certainly. You see, it's not, the, the V1 is quite far removed, really, from the generation of a motor response. If you inject um, GABA inhibitors into areas which are closely linked to the execution of motor acts, then the, uh, 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 the uh, uh, effect is seen because you generate a, a, a motor response. Or if it's muscimol, you inhibit the motor response. But the frontal, the, 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 uh, you see this in the frontal eye fields. But you don't see this in, the, in V1 because the V1 is predominantly uh, a system that analyzes visual percepts, yeah? as are V2 and V4 and all those other higher cortical visual areas. Any further questions? <laughs>
All right, very good. So I will see you then next Monday. And I think you'll find that an interesting session. We're going to talk about movement. And we're not going to talk about regular movements. We're also going to talk about uh, <coughs> confusing kinds of movements, yeah. Like, especially very important, apparent motion. You realize, just, just to say one more word here, that uh, uh, nowadays, when you, when you go home and watch television, almost all the motion that you see on a TV is apparent motion, not real motion. And I'll keep thinking about that, and I'll tell you about that next time. Oh yeah, sorry, it's not Monday. It's our next, our next session is next Wednesday. Sorry about. That.